Hey everyone, it's Timmy Gobbles, and today I'm doing a little more proc gen. This one is for more of like a Terraria-like game. So I'm going to want a couple layers that represent the different layers of ground. And then I want to make some little caves. Maybe they're not all connected, maybe some are separated. So I might use a bump map for like the layer height and maybe some like minimum spanning tree to make the caves. And we'll need a start point that's on the ground and not like inside of the ground. Maybe we can use some kind of distribution to distribute the ore and stuff. So starting off, we're just gonna have a scene with a tile map, a camera, and in the script is gonna be something to be able to control the camera and look around. So just a zoom in, zoom out, move, move up, down, left, right. And so first off, we're gonna be using some noise to make those height maps. So using the noise, uh, the get noise 2D function, which takes an X and a Y and gives out a float between negative one and one, uh, we can generate a height map by fixing that Y value. X. So we need to scan across all the X values and for each one, uh, for each layer, we need to decide how to fill in the tile from the tile map. So each layer is gonna have a height that I also need to loop through. And oh, I've got my indexes wrong because it's upside down. So on the tile map class, uh, negative is up and positive is down. So that's what happens. Okay, so now that's looking pretty good. So now that it works for one layer, I need to make it work for more than one layer. So instead of just stone, let's go ahead and throw in a like dirt grass layer. And go ahead and see how that looks. Hey, okay, so that's kind of working. The, the layers are similar, but different, which is kind of what I'm going for. And go ahead and throw in a third layer. Looks a little wonky. Keep working on it though. So instead of adding the noise on top of itself, Let's go ahead and just set it equal. That way it doesn't get a little too wild on the top layer. So here we go. And it's just a little too similar on each layer. So what I need to do is vary that Y value more between each layer. So what I can do is I can multiply that J, which is the Y value, by some kind of integer. And that looks a little better. So the layers are different, but they're still a little similar. And it's that way because the noise from fast noise light is going to be smooth. Now, if we make the frequency too big, uh, it's a little too wild. So I kind of played around with the frequency level to try to get something that I liked. And that looks a lot better. So they're, they're still a little different, but you can definitely, the, the peaks and valleys are definitely preserved between the layers. Now for this project, I'm primarily going to be using three layers which is gonna be something that's a mix between dirt and stone. And then as it moves down, there's more stone. And then you get to kind of like that bedrock layer in uh, like Minecraft. So instead of just filling it with the same tile, I'm gonna use another 2D map to choose a tile from this big dictionary. So I'm gonna use a big old um, if else statement to do that. Now I could have used a match statement if I like multiplied by 10 and then did like, rounded the value and then did a match statement, but I ended up using this if else, and I think that's fine. Okay, so now that's loaded in, let's take a look. And there's way too much of one kind of tile. So what did I do wrong? Like we can see other tiles, but it's just overwhelmingly one kind. And if you look here, I totally forgot the noise goes between negative one and one. So over half the tiles were large coal or coal large, I should say. Okay, so that's a little better, but it's still kind of not what I'm looking for. So I'm gonna go back to the project in the last video, and I kind of play around with the noise settings, and I think I'm gonna be using the cell value type. And I went ahead and played with the domain warp too to see if that looked kind of how I wanted it. And so it's not quite what I'm looking for. I might need to play with the frequency. So if we bump up the frequency a little bit, and I'm gonna make sure this gets set. Okay, so that's a little better. So I like it more with the clusters of different types of um, ore ground. 
and if we bring the frequency down a little bit, it's um, definitely not varied enough. See, you have these huge regions of the same kind of stuff. Now, if we bump it up a lot, this is way too messy. So I'll bring it down a little bit to 0.3. And then I took the domain warping off because that also kind of messed it up a bit. And this looks a lot better. So I think this is in a good enough state that we can move on to the next steps. So next up, I want to be able to punch out a line between two points on my tile map. So I'm going to use uh, Bressenham's algorithm. So if we have two points, then we can find the slope between them. And if you look at this picture, we start on the left. If we know the slope, we can, we can scan over the X values and know what tile that line is in, in the set, if you look at the center of the tiles. So here I have that 0 0.05 multiplier and I ended up taking that away because I was messing up the math a bit in my head. But that should just be like load of P2Y minus P1Y is less than P2X minus P2 or P1X. So if the change in Y is less than the change in X, then we want to scan across the X value. But if the change in Y is greater than the change in X, then we want to scan across the Y value. And one thing tricky with the range function is the lower bound has to be less than or equal to the upper bound or it will return no values. And so I want the Bressenham to return a vector of all the points on that line. And I have a width value. So what's gonna happen is that width value is gonna change how many tiles I look up or down as I scan across each X value or uh, you know, Y value if the slope is too big. So there we go, that's working pretty good. And then punch out's just gonna take those points and uh, erase them. So next let's look at the Poisson disk sampling. So if we have a point, we wanna look at a disk around it and pick some points on that disk, then get rid of those disks, look at one of the other points and then pick some random points around that. If we just randomly apply points to our map, they're gonna cluster too much. And one of the neat things about the algorithm is it uses this grid to fastly look at the nearby points to make sure that there aren't any that are too nearby it. So you don't have to look at all the points that you've generated. So when it sets up the grid, you have an index to the array of points that tells you what point is in that grid. Then we lay down the disk and randomly generate points and each time we want to make sure that that point isn't too close to another point. See, this is too close, so we're not going to get rid of that one. And then there's one over here. We can put a three in that grid. And then I had to do some control Z to get rid of those disks. And just imagine we generated these as well. So then we're going to look at point number two or three. I guess we'll look at two and we'll do the same thing with that. And we're going to go ahead and do this process until we're out of points to do it with and then we'll have completely generated the points in the uh, thing so i'm going to use a lambda which is a function or rather i should say callable that's defined inside the function and that's because i don't need it in anywhere else in my code and that's going to convert points into uh, which grid box that's inside so i'm going to have this processing list those are going to be the points that we need to generate random points around so after a number of tries that point is removed from that processing list, and then we move on to the next one of the processing list. Here's like a quick pseudocode of uh, the algorithm. So we need to generate a random point in that disk. So what I did was I randomly scaled a unit vector that's randomly rotated around the point, and that ended up working. I did have to use my matrix class for this, but you can just come up with a quick grid class to use. You don't have to use my very bloated matrix um, class. So there's a lot of things we need to check when we generate a new point. So is it too close to another point? We can look at the adjacent cells on the grid and see if they have values assigned to them. If, there's, if it, they're negative one, then we know that there isn't a point already in that grid. And we also need to check whether the grid that the point's in has a value, because that means there's another point in it. 
And later on, I'm going to check to see if it's within the boundary of the terrain layer. But I didn't quite get there in this video. So if any of those checks happen and return true, then we end up having to not choose that point and generate another one. And the new points count is going to be the number of times we try before we move on to the next point in the processing list. So this algorithm took me the bulk of this video. Uh, it was really messy because there were so many indices and I had to change my custom class a little bit. And But finally, here we go. We have some Poisson dissampled points. And I went ahead and changed that minimum distance to be a little smaller so you can see a little better. So in this video, uh, we learned kind of how to distribute minerals, how to draw a line between two points, and then how to generate some points that aren't too close but aren't too far from each other. So in the next video, oh, here was the Poisson code in case you wanted to copy it or something. And it was a real mess and I think I had to change some of it later, but we'll kind of see. Oh, and before the while loop, you have to generate your first point. But I think this is a good like initial implementation of the algorithm, mostly because it works. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of room for improvement to clean up. Anyway, so we're halfway there to making caves. Um, in the next video, I'm going to group those points. Remember, I don't want every single point to connect in the graph. Then we're going to use minimum spanning tree on each of the groups. And then we're going to use cellular automata to make the caves look a little less rigid. 